with that, I will turn it over to Salima uh, for the roll call. Thank you so much, Ashanti. I think I've got most people, so I'm just going to confirm we've got Barry from the Building Trades. I see Eric yep. from Hennepin County. Is Gilbert also joining us? Okay. Um, yes, I, know I, I am here. Oh, welcome, Gilbert. Thank uh, you. Sorry. I don't see Marvin. Are you here, Marvin? Okay. I see Sheila and Julie. Welcome. Is Melanie Williams from Twin Cities Rise? Okay. Tony, I see you from Summit Academy. Mora from Higher Minnesota. Uh, Leslie from City of Minneapolis. John O'Fallon from Ramsey County. Anybody from MnDOT? Mary Schmidt here. Thank you. Oh, welcome, Mary. I see uh, Krista. Dale, are you here? Okay. I see Katie from CS McCrossin. Chris from APJV and Mike also from APJV. Uh, from uh, Human Rights, we have Elaine and Brianne. Uh, I see Ashante, Sam, John, and Mahad from the Met Council. Anyone else from the Met Council here? Uh, I am Aaron Kosky, Workforce Development. Oh, hi, Eric. Welcome to the call. Um, and then, uh, do we have anybody from the project office? Uh, this is Amy Loring. I'm a recruiter with RailWork. Um, so I work with the project team um, who may be joining at some point, but otherwise I will be here for RailWork. Okay, thanks so much, Aaron. We appreciate it. Um, I did see Sam Sam on earlier. Is she still on from the project? Yes. 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 Sam's here. here. I see Brian from Ellis Black. Anyone else from Ellis Black? Um, Andy Robinson, Salima. Oh, welcome, Andy. Did we miss anyone else? I didn't hear my name call. Oh, welcome. Mel, welcome to the call. Welcome to the call, Mel. Okay. All I think that, that may be everybody. Are we missing anyone? Okay. Well, we just wanted to remind the, the group that our meeting minutes from last month are in the handout packet. And if you have any edits, any additions or corrections, if you could please let Ashanti or I know so that we can make those corrections. Um, and reflect them in the record. Thank you, Ashanti. All right. Um, next up on the agenda, we have an update from Building Strong Communities. Uh, Aaron Kosky. Thank you, Ashanti. Um, thank you again for the time. <clears throat> this is. Uh, we're towards the end of this phase of the program and really appreciate and I'm grateful, we are grateful for the opportunity to keep this group updated and have this group contribute to the success of this cohort. Uh, Barry Davies, uh, leadership member of the BSC program is on the call too and I expect him to jump in with any comments he has at any point. Next slide, please. Reminder that this is a multiple multiple step um, trade preparatory program. We are just on the cusp of completing step four. We have seven individuals who have been placed already up to this point, and we have 18 remaining who are pursuing their apprenticeship of choice or an apprenticeship in the construction trades. We've been blessed with the great diversity, not only in background, but gender experience. And um, with the recent loosening of the COVID restrictions, we've had a number of in-person uh, events that has bound and, and uh, create a, a good sense of team as this group of individuals has, again, are getting close or have already started their apprenticeship. Just note that again, step five is that one year of follow up during their first apprenticeship. So we're beginning to support those seven and looking forward to um, have the 18 start their apprenticeship soon. Next slide. And really, this is just a, one of the multiple 
recent May experiences we've had to get deeper into the various uh, trades that are participating. Last week, uh, two weeks ago, we had a visit with the Heat and Frost Workers Union. Um, great opportunity there. Next slide. And again, one of our great supporters, the iron workers, uh, had another uh, hands-on experience. Um, very memorable as well. So uh, this week alone, we've had three, uh, three hands-on trade experiences, as well as um, tomorrow, a group of participants are joining uh, the joint venture on a construction field trip on the Excelsior Bridge project on the Southwest project. So I know that everyone's excited for that. Next page, please. Next slide. Uh, Minda was a great partner in opening up and, and showing the uh, 35W94 uh, project as well, which is uh, they appreciated. Next. And these um, seven, it looks like it got a little bit twisted with the layout, but seven of this current group um, have again started their apprenticeships in uh, four different trades. Uh, we are looking for a number of those are council contractors and uh, potentially a contractor on the Southwest project as well. Our efforts now with the culmination of official programming next week will be on assisting those 18 remaining individuals start their apprenticeship. And we hope to have that um, at least 100% receive offers again this next, uh, this next month in June. I think that's our last slide. If you can go to the next one just to confirm. So uh, again, focusing on, and I'll turn over to Barry in a second, just the, uh, the focus. Um, it's, it's challenging for anyone to start a new career, uh, but the real payoff is gonna have them when they get through their first year of apprentice, apprenticeship. Statistics in any industry show that that first year, you know, you are going to, you got over the hard part and now you're really building your career. And that's what we hope to do. And the picture is showing our last year's apprentices that are most of them on that page are one year into their apprenticeship, we're happy to report. And then again, supporting those who are um, starting that journey now. Uh, Barry, have any comments in general or specifically you want to share? No, just not anything to add, but you know, the group this year was dedicated and involved just like the group last year was. Uh, one of the best things about this program is this follow-up and this uh, <clears throat> continued support. It's not like it's okay, now you're in a, one of the trades, we'll see you have a good career. You know, this year-long follow-up has really been useful and it's uh, something that I believe the iron workers are gonna do with our own union um, <clears throat> and try to implement this because uh, like Aaron said, that first year of any new occupation is the hardest. And so whatever extra support we can give, you know, it'll just lead to more and more success. Thank you, Barry. Um, I guess my closing as I turn it back over is um, next month and for the future summer monthly meetings, we will continue to share results on the successful placement and retainage of these participants. Um, and we start thinking about what the future is gonna look like uh, for the future programming. Hopefully COVID is over um, so that we can hopefully, again, have a stronger program with more hands-on in person. My final comment is just, um, I wanted to again, emphasize, recognize that this is a, ch a really, um, a really successful and a lot of hard work goes into this program and the unions have demonstrated yeah, this really quick. my staff just the uh the commitment they have to make a program work to increase and make the diversity and inclusion stay in these industries so hats are off to my union fellow uh leaders in this program thank you so let's leave it back over to you Any questions for Aaron or Barry? Um, and before that, I just want to also um, offer uh, our appreciation and uh, support for this uh, 
for this cohort and this program in general. Um, and I'm again going to say I'm I'm glad to see the number of women um, that are part of this program because, again, we we talk about this as a committee um, that that has to be a focus of our efforts and strategies moving forward in terms of bringing women into this industry um, and fostering that uh, their their successful participation and retention. So thank you. Any questions? All right, I don't hear any or see any hands. Um, so we are going to move to the next spot in the agenda, um, which is the project office uh, for project update. All right, uh, good afternoon, everybody. This is Sam O'Connell and uh, with the project office, I'm just gonna run through some slides to show you what construction uh, looks like it's definitely active out there because uh, our uh, residents are letting us know that they are definitely hearing and in some cases feeling construction, but that's okay. That's that's just ensuring some progress. So we're going to start out on our western terminus at Southwest Station in Eden Prairie, and you can see that second level um, going in there. And again, the at Southwest Station, uh, we're going to have both the light rail as well as Southwest Transit uh, serving this location. Uh, next slide, please. So we're just kind of moving one um, position east to Eden Prairie Town Center Station. So again, in Eden Prairie, and this is part of a kind of new development area within Eden Prairie that's going to make this area a little bit more walkable, transit uh, friendly, kind of supporting more of a transit um, supportive lifestyle in here. So very excited to see this station uh, kind of rising from the ground. Uh, moving to the next. Uh, slide um, again, kind of one of our um, bigger elements on the corridors that southern portal of 62. So if you're driving by, you can see this and see the southern portal here, uh, and uh, so pretty exciting uh, seeing that work continue on. Moving on to the next slide. Um, so as Aaron talked about the uh, the, the uh, site visit that our Building Strong Communities will be doing, they'll be taking a look at this uh, LRT bridge that goes over Excelsior and kind of how it's all coming together and um, the exciting um, construction activities that are occurring here. So again, I would just implore you if you are in the area in Hopkins and Excelsior to take a look at this. This is pretty cool. So um, we'll move to the next slide here. And talking about stations, we have another station in Minneapolis that's coming out of the ground. So this is our uh, West 21st Street station, and I'm pretty excited about seeing this uh, in development and, and continue to, um, to move forward in its progress. Next slide, please. And then also just our continued um, work at Franklin um, Operation and Maintenance Facility that's going on. So thanks folks for that. And um, this is the expansion work here. And some of you can maybe see some of this as you're driving by on 94 in terms of the work. But um, again, to help us accommodate um, some of our light rail vehicles that will uh, that are part of our new fleet. And moving to the next slide, speaking of our new fleet, um, just a couple weeks ago, the first vehicle um, that's part of the 27 vehicles um, that we are procuring um, and building as part of this project um, actually went into operations, revenue operations. So um, tested, vetted, all that wonderful stuff, and then just up and down the blue line. And what, the picture that you're seeing here is the middle car, so you can see the new seating arrangement. Uh, that the Southwest LRT vehicles will have. So this opens up the aisle. So those folks that um, use mobility devices can actually travel through the train. This uh, C car was a pinch point for us um, with the uh, seats facing the other way. So we've expanded the aisle from 26 inches to 40 inches. And again, allows folks to travel the whole width of the train car concepts without having to leave um, the actual vehicle. So um, pretty exciting um, activities going along the corridor and uh, happy to stand for any questions. Otherwise, I can uh, throw this back to our co-chairs. Any questions for the project office? All 
All right. Thank you, Sam. All right. Thank you. Moving on. Um, next, we have John Tao um, with the DBE Achievement Reporting. Thank you. All right. Slide 19 here. And uh, these are the numbers as of March 31st um, for the uh, civil contract systems and the Franklin O&M. Uh, as we've shared last month, uh, we know that there are some changes coming down, change orders coming down the pipeline, which may increase the contract amounts. So we are you know, having discussions with the prime contractors and watching pretty closely uh, as to where they are increasing DBE participation so that their uh, DBE achievement meets the goal or exceeds the goal. So that's kind of where we're at right now. And we're kind of just anticipating and waiting for, um, you know, the discussions between the council and the contractors for that and for the information to flow back to us regarding uh, where DBE participation and contracts will be at. Um, if you look within the handouts, we have included the three DBE participation uh, progress reports for the three contracts that are currently active right now. And this is also where if there are any contract changes, that would be where we would be highlighting them and where you would see them uh, later on when those changes are made. So um, right now, all of the contracts are doing pretty well. Uh, so, you know, that definitely uh, gives us some confidence as we move on into this, uh, you know, year, construction year. So uh, if there are any questions, I can uh, respond to them. Otherwise, I will um, give it back to the chairs. Any questions for John? All right. Moving on, uh, LMJV, civil DBE activities. Wonderful. Thanks, Ashante. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Krista Seberg, the EEO officer for Lunda Construction and the compliance person for the joint venture with CS McCrossin on the project. So as you guys can see, um, for our DBE participation for last month and this month, um, we have quite a few on on site right now for our overall civil contract. So many that we've actually expanded it to a two page document. So you can see those here. And then if you guys would move ahead to the second slide, please. There's the next, the, the remainder of the civil, as well as the Lunda stations contract where we have four active participants, uh, DBE participants on the project. Any questions regarding our on-site DBE work? If not, we will move forward to the next slide, please. Here's just kind of fun fact sheet, um, just to keep you guys apprised of different things. Um, owner change orders approved as of April 15th for this is a whopping $44 million. Well, $193,823, sorry. Current DBE participation is 20.5% of a goal that is 16%. It is so wonderful to see that number. Very encouraging and very exciting for our DBE partners on this wonderful project. And this verbiage for the last piece, I should have changed the verbiage. We have over 64 DBE contracts slash change or, or not changers um, work being done. Um, some of those Contracts are multiple contracts with the same DBE, you know, so it, it shows a, a bigger number, but it's just showing we have a lot of work being done by our DBE trade partners in the industry. And there's some fun pictures of them below. On to the next screen, please. Our highlight this month is a trade partner that has been around for a little time now working with the various um, light rail projects and stuff and that's our great trade partner E&J Rebar. Um, they have a wonderful like I stated reputation you know doing the job getting the job done in within that scope you know kind of 
tough scope of work, you know, and so you can see what their contract is to date and how much has been paid to date. And they're here for quite some time yet, you guys. You know, you think about it, we're in May of 2021. You know, estimated completion of the project is 2024, and their work goes goes quite a bit through to that. Not all the way, but almost. And here's a wonderful statement. We thought instead of getting it from our side, let's hear what E&J has to say. You guys will get to hear them later, but um, getting a statement from Liz, E&J is working on its third light rail project. And our project has been a very challenging yet rewarding project. The ongoing changes has been the biggest challenge, but the rewarding part of the project is keeping our workforce working steadily. So that's wonderful. Um, and we are working very closely with them regarding their workforce and stuff because they have one of the tougher trades. So uh, thank you for your time on that one. And I think that's it for our DBE slides. Any questions regarding our the LMJV's civil DBE participation? If not, we will hand it over, I do believe, to the systems. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Chris Gannon with APJV, the PM for the uh, systems project. <clears throat> Hope everyone's doing well this afternoon. Next slide, please. So every, as uh, Mike and I have stated the past few meetings, the majority of our field work has been moved from uh, this year, 21, into 22. However, we do have some work coming up. Um, in May and June, uh, Gunner is back out there working for us, doing communications work at the Eden Prairie Town Center station. And they'll be migrating over to Shady Oaks station and they're, gonna, they're putting in speaker back boxes in the ceilings of the uh, stations. And then in July, we have, um, we're gonna start doing the traction power substation foundations. We have Dione Construction. They're gonna be doing erosion control and some silt fence. Um, then we have sub, uh, subcontractors to Meyer. Bald Eagle is gonna be doing forming, rebar and pouring concrete. Moltron is going to be providing the laborers for that work. And then we have MBE doing some trucking. And then finally, IMO, they're going to help us out with the uh, pre-inspection before we start doing the work out there. Next slide, please. Um, so with b &L, we've made some progress with them. We issued them a purchase order, a pretty significant purchase order for a signal cable. Um, you can see they're just less than um, 900,000. And then another new item that I just found out about today, which is why it isn't on this slide, we finally uh, came into an agreement with IMO on their subcontract. So we have a fully executed subcontract with them. So John, you'll see in our update for next month, we'll have them listed on our uh, DVE program and they're DBE commitment is $266,000. Next slide, please. And then here we are, uh, change order wise, we're just about a million dollars in change orders from the council and generation cable and gunner electric are the biggest uh, uh, DBE subs um, on how that change order work is distributed. Um, and DBE job participation to date, like John showed on the earlier slide, is 16.1, and our commitment is slightly over 12%. And I think that is it, unless anyone has any questions on the systems project. All right, thank you. All right, next, uh, Ellis Black, Franklin, o and Yep, this is Brian Leach with Ellis Black. Uh, talk about Franklin here, you can go ahead to that first slide, thank you. Uh, so here's just a quick update, current contract, as you can see, there's that 39, just over 39 million um, DBE contracts compared to that, puts us right at 20%. And then the bottom bullet there, showing kind of how we're billed through 4.1, we're at 22 to the owner. Our DBE teams have, are at that four and a half roughly, so just tracking right at 
Um, and I believe our goal was 16. So looking good there. And we've got, I'll, I'll go through a little bit of upcoming work here on this next slide, please. And then here's some of our major players. Um, go Fetch Mechanical has a big portion of our work and they're continuing to kind of get us to the finish line with a lot of interior work uh, in that HVAC MEP scope. Uh, Nakasone Painting also has a large contract and they're, they're, they're really stepping up to doing a lot of doing a lot of interior work now that we've transitioned to that area. And then these other couple here, Bald Eagle Erectors, we're hopeful to award them a future change order. Um, so that will also help um, with DB numbers. Uh, and then Camacho Roofing finishing up, always stone and tile, some interior work going on. And Amtec Steel, we've kind of had some ongoing uh, steel issues. So between Bald Eagle and Amtec. It's been nice to have that team help us out on those changes. So those are kind of the major players right now with DB for roughly this month and next month. Next slide, please. I think that was it. Sorry, let me, is there any questions that anyone has about the Franklin project? Thank you very much for your presentation. Now we'll move on to the workforce participation, Elaine. Hi everyone. Um, can you see the next slide, please? Can you see the next slide, please? So for the civil contract in March, um, the joint venture worked forty two thousand nine hundred fifty one hours, and project to date from the start of the project, it's one million sixty seven thousand nine hundred ninety five hours. In March, um, the Representation for women came in at 6.59% and they're at 8.19 overall. For people of color and indigenous people, they came in at 22.13% and they're at 21 and they're at 21.32%. Um, the unspecified hours for the month were 0.61% and they're at 0.35% overall. Next slide, please. So the breakdown in terms of the hours, uh, for unspecified, there were 264 hours that were reported. That was the 0.61%. Uh, white women worked 1,748 hours, and that was 4.07%. And women of color were 1,083 hours, or 2.252%. Uh, men of color worked 8,420 hours. 19.6% and white men work 31,437 hours or 73.19%. Next slide, please. So the trucking um, during the month, month, of, month, of, month of, oh, excuse me, it's not March, it's from the start of the project. From MBE, uh, We've recorded 19,244 hours. ZTS is 3,581 hours. And Rock on Trucks was 683 hours. Next slide, please. I think that is, um, are there any questions on the civil contract? So the systems contract, again, there were no hours worked during March. Um, the APJV remains at 29.5% for women and 29.5% for people of color and indigenous people. Next slide, please. For the Ellis Black Project at the Franklin O&M facility, facility um, they worked 8,640 acres and since the start of the project, uh, they have worked 46,628 hours. 4.2% uh, were women in March, and overall they're at 8.49% um, in terms of the women representation. For people of color and indigenous people, they came in at 22.62%, and overall they're at 24.73%. The unspecified hours were a little high this month, 16.6%. Uh, Overall, however, they're at 5.02%. Next 
Next slide, please. So the breakdown in the hours, 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 uh, the was 1,397 hours. That was the 16.16%. White women worked 248 hours. 2.86 percent color worked 119 hours or 1.38 percent and men of color worked 1837 hours or 21.24 percent uh, white men were 5047 hours or 58.37 percent and i believe that is the report i encourage you all to take a look at the handouts that has the breakdowns from for each of the subcontractors that worked in March and also from the start of the project and what their specific breakdowns are in terms of the hours that they've worked and they've worked and their um, representation of women and people of color and indigenous people. Are there any color indigenous people? Are there any questions? Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, just wanted I will to turn it back on you. Yeah, I just wanted to point out on the on the Franklin O and M project that the unspecified hours are quite high right now, which means that we don't know who is working on that project for that percentage. It's like sixteen percent for the month of March. So if there is a way to find out, it's possible that that uh, some of those numbers could actually be helping your workforce goals if we know who they were. So just something to kind of. Uh, we can we can work with you and your and your subs on that if you wanted to contact us and so we can support you on on, on figuring that out. Thank you. We're ready for our workforce part, uh, uh, activities reports. Let's start with um, LMJV. Guys, it's Krista again. So let's dig right into it. Let's go to the next slide, please. Um, again, there's so much activity going on right now regarding the the recruitment and the advocacy and the development of workforce, we needed two slides and it uh, could have actually been more. So if you want to peruse through, um, here they are. But what I'm going to do is talk about those events that and meetings that took place this last month that really, all of them are very important, but there's just some that are really fun to highlight so that you guys can hear what's going on, but also you can hear the great things going on with some of the people involved in this meeting here which is really neat. Number one, I want to bring up what I'm calling triple play for this project. And it's the joint, it's the activity that's going on between the civil, the systems, and the Franklin o &M. We have a great opportunity on this magnitude state project to work together regarding workforce opportunities and development. And it's really fun to be able to have partnered with the other two contracts you know, um, to, to move forward on these activities. And last month was the true start of what's going on. Um, we hosted our first of two um, contractor CBO connecting events. And we had a wonderful presentation with Building Strong Communities, with Urban League, with Merrick, and also with John O'Fallon with Ramsey County with his upcoming June 9th event which I'll talk about in our upcoming stuff. So that was a great presentation. Oh my gosh, I think we had over 30 um, people involved in the after, you know, the that part of the meeting. And it was just, it was very informative for our subcontractors and just providing that connection piece, you know, so everybody can take it to the next, next step. And I couldn't believe how many people responded when we sent out the contact information for those um, organizations. So now we get to do this upcoming month, you know, for, for June, we're doing part two and we'll be working with, um, and now I lost my page of everybody, but it'll be with Julie with Hire. We're gonna work with Rise. We're gonna work with Helmets to Hard Hats, um, the uh, Girl Scouts of America, well, Girl Scouts of St. Croix Valley, just, you know, to, to continue these connecting pieces, you know, not just for us, the general contractors, but for our subcontractors. Uh, so that's a wonderful, wonderful piece. The other thing that I get to highlight um, from this last month, and excuse the um, is the relationship that continues to grow with the wonderful team at Building Strong Communities. We were honored to be a part of their interview process that brought their participants from stage one 
to stage two, those interviews were so enlightening, showing us the true magnitude of excitement and want for the participants, participants that are in the project that when I had a meeting with our Lunda internal group, we talked about bringing in um, either an apprentice or somebody new. We were looking at filling a yard position and it got us talking about a bridging program with building strong communities. But on Lunda's side, where we would take an individual or multitude of them from the program and then bring them into the Lunda family and bridge them into which career pathway, which trade they wanted to go to by showing them in our yard the different opportunities, you know, with the equipment operator, you know, so with the 49ers or with the, the carpenters, you know, with welding or, you know, the just magnitude of different areas. So we interviewed four individuals referred to us from the Building Strong Communities, five, maybe, oh, oh I'm off on my numbers, and we actually hired one. That started with Lunda Construction last week. Um, this individual, she's so excited to learn more about being an operating engineer. Our team is so excited to be mentoring her. The other, we ended up hiring three individuals. Another individual actually came to us from the cement finishers um, and the tarot program that she was involved with. She actually tried, um, she thought she wanted to be a cement finisher and it wasn't her pathway. So instead of just giving up, um, we sat down with her and talked to her about different avenues and the yard position was brought up and she just thought it was the neatest thing and a great opportunity. So she also started last week. So those are some in, uh, great things that have come about because of this, the Building Strong Community Program. Um, so those are a couple of really cool things from last month. Moving forward though, like I said, we have our next meeting coming up and we're also gonna be meeting with um, LS Balak and, and Mike with Aldrich. You know, regarding now that some of the things are starting to lighten up, we're gonna be able to do more in-person things and, and doing stuff regarding the actual, with the light rail project. Um, and Aaron Koski had brought up tomorrow, they're doing a tour with the project, so that's cool. But actually hosting some career awareness fairs, you know, and job, you know, fairs and such. So we have some great communications taking place regarding that, as well as the great, huge Minnesota Construction Crews seventh annual hiring fair on June 9th. So that's those. That's just a quick nutshell of what we're up to regarding workforce um, recruitment and development. Next slide, please. And there's upcoming. We talked about the tour. And the round table discussion with um, the unions is the, the June event. Actually, boy, I'm way behind. That's going to be in July because we had so much fun with our CBOs that we had to advance that a little bit. So um, on to the next screen, please. And then here was, now remember, it's a month. When I get the reports, there's still things taking place. So total new hires and transfers. When I requested this a week and a half ago, at the time we were bringing in the operators. The operate we were bringing back operating engineers um, that were either transfers or new height, you know, that brought back from their, the layoff and such. Um, but after talking with Bruce, our director of field operations, we actually, between the time I did the report and now, we also had six individuals that were new hires, four of them being minor the POCI males. Uh, so that number has increased. And then after our team met last or met earlier this week, Dale was a part of I was not in a, I was not able to attend, that the forecast for the next four weeks would that we would be um, hiring six to eight individuals to add to our current team. There's that one. And next screen please. I think that's it. Yes. Any questions for me regarding workforce? No questions, I will hand it over to the systems group. Thanks everyone. Hello everybody, this is Mike from Aldridge Parsons Joint Venture. Hope everybody's having a great day. Nice to have 80 degree weather here in Chicago. So. Um, so our plan 
the APJV, you know, we're gonna, Chris talked about, we have Gunner working minimal hours in May and June. Uh, all Parsons JV reported zero hours in March and, uh, and a total of eight hours in the month of April for Gunner Electric and, and they were just doing some of those communication boxes. So we, um, we just this last month, we had a great meeting with Justin and, and, and Andy from, um, um, Justin is from uh, Helmets to Hard Hats. Uh, he's the Minnesota director and Local 160 is, is the business manager, not the business manager, but membership development coordinator. And we introduced those two. They hadn't, they hadn't known each other, but they operate in all the same circles and, um, and military vets um, have a, you know, are, have the CDL light. A lot of them have CDL licenses coming from the, the services. And that's just a great fit for the outside electricians, which is one of the requirements if you want to get into the apprenticeship program. And that's the CDL is, is a barrier of entry in a, in a, in a lot of instances. Uh, but um, with that being said, they had a good meeting with Justin and Andy, and uh, we hope to, to, to be able to identify opportunities for veterans. Uh, we participated uh, with the three primes in the, with the CDOs on May 12th, and we had a few of our subcontractors there. Yeah, I know Gunnar was there. I know Meyer was there. I know um, all, you know, Aldridge was there. So it was just a great meeting to meet the CBOs and a lot of good experiences. Uh, we're meeting with Build Strong Communities in about an hour and a half uh, to talk to their cohort via Zoom. Um, we have the ACE intern uh, starting with us in, in, in late June for six to eight weeks. Uh, high school kid. He's going to be, he's a senior. He's going on to the Milwaukee Engineer School of Engineering. So that, that's a great opportunity there. Um, a couple other events that we have coming up in June is we have um, Summit Academy, you know, another more mock interviews on June 4th. We're doing the Minnesota Career Fair on June 9th uh, with John O'Fallon's group and, and that opportunity, the, I guess the seventh annual. And um, I was talking to Summit Academy today and, um, you know, Aldridge is, has uh, two training vehicles that we take around the country for training for our employees and uh, and I was involved in in DC uh, as far as a training program with a with a with a, a pre-apprenticeship program out in DC and it was just a great a great day and uh, I'm hoping we can partner up with Summit Academy and some other institutions like Dunwoody and, and just show them what we do what we experience in, in manholes and underground work and pulling cable and dealing with high voltage and the safety involved. So it'll be an opportunity to bring those vehicles and do trainings that, you know, actually we, we train on for our field in which we take around the country. So I'll be hoping to do several of those throughout the course of the project, uh, just to get a hands-on on what we're seeing and feeling and uh, identify what we actually do. And then those are, that's going to be a great opportunity. And, um, and that's about it. Again, we're not really starting work until 2022. We do have piecemeal work here in 2021, but really our hiring is going to be coming in, in 2022 and uh, the spring of 2022. And uh, that's when the push is going to be. So thank you again for your time. Thank you. Ellis Black. Hey, everybody. It's Brian Leach again. Ellis Black, you can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so some of our workforce activities, I'll run through this and, and forgive me, I've been out of the office with a personal injury for a couple of weeks here. So um, this is just the best update we had for what's what's upcoming. Uh, we had a good faith effort meeting with MDHR this morning, I believe. Um, so we continue to do those on a monthly basis and see what we can continue to do in that regard. Uh, I gotta say a huge thanks to Krista for, for all the work she's done. She mentioned a ton of stuff at the start of this uh workforce activities and, and we've kind of been leaning on her and some of the activities she's been setting up uh, both with cbos that we've sent out to all of our subs and then the presentation she's put together so thanks krista and, and we look forward to some of those upcoming meetings with, with our teams as well um i'm going to skip that last slide we've got internally a new compliance officer at our team that's going to we're looking forward to um helping us out um mostly just working with my council and, and access to L LCP and, and workforce reporting. It seems like it's an area that can be improved on our project to at least know where we're at with our sub teams. So looking forward to have that individual help us out 
um, with the bullet above, more or less uh, reminder emails and, and what, what our teams are doing. Um, I think I've stressed it before, but we just really want to hear hear back from our sub teams on what they're doing to 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 match or increase their workforce particip participation as necessary. Uh, I think we got one more slide here if you want to go to the next one. Yep. And then I think I mentioned it, but those four organizations and CBOs that, that Krista had mentioned, we pass those along to our subcontract teams. Um, so in collaboration with some of these with our new compliance officer, uh, some of the emails for our teams, these are some avenues that they can potentially reach out to to increase. So, so we're, we're excited for that. We do still have quite a bit of work going uh, coming up here this, this summer and into the fall. So opportunities there. And then I believe that that career fair was the 9th of June. So in about two weeks, that's again, you got to thank Krista for that. But hopefully some of our subcontract teams as as we were requested can can attend that and see if there's anybody else that can help out uh, their participation. I think that was it. Does anybody have any Franklin related questions? I have a question, yes. Brian, it's Krista. Welcome back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. You. <laughs> Thank hey, you. What is the name of your new compliance officer? Her name is Linda. And hang on, I'll look up her last name here. I don't want to screw it up. Krakow. <laughs> what is it, Andy? Linda yeah, Krakow. Linda Krakow. K-R-E-C-K-O-W. Wonderful. Do you, would you do me a favor and email me her information? I'd love to introduce myself and welcome her. Yep, no problem. I'll shoot it over to you right now, Krista. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Any questions for any of our primes regarding their workforce activities? Okay, well, thank you. Well, we're very um, excited today. We have a um, invited some of our larger subcontractors to uh, meet the advisory today and to uh, discuss a little bit about their own uh, workforce participation and how they are doing in terms of the their recruitment and retention so that they can um, um, support the prime in meeting the workforce goals. And we are really um, happy to have a, a, a group of subs that I think um, are, are very well known to us, but it's exciting to hear from them about, about what they've been doing. Um, if we can go to the next slide, we can introduce the panelists. So we um, just want to confirm, Becky, you're here from Standard Contracting. Okay, um, Railworks, Delta Joint Venture. Yes, uh, we are um, in the in the meeting. Uh, this is Amy. I'm the recruiter with Railworks. Amy, welcome to the call. Uh, Bill, you're here from Minger. I am. Yeah, welcome. Um, Pete's Water and Sewer. Tony. Oh, did I hear you? Okay. Ian J. Rebar. Uh, this is Mike. Mike uh, with E and J. I'm here. Welcome, Mike. And then Egan. Yep. This is Aaron Niels. I'm uh, the EEO officer for Egan Company. Okay. That's very, very helpful. Um, well, thank you. If I can ask those of you who are on the panel to just get your um, your uh, so we can see you. If you can turn on your video, that will really help our um, the advisory be able to see you. So we're going to just start by asking each of you to tell us a little bit about your. Um, your company and uh, the, and and what you are doing on this project and how long you've been around. Um, so why don't we uh, uh, go in the order of, of the names as we see them? Why don't we start with uh, uh, Anne from Railworks and work our way down? Thank you. On mute, Anne. Hi, um, sorry about that. Um, my name is Amy. I'm with uh, Railworks Corporation. Um, I have been, I'm a recruiter with Railworks and I've been supporting the project um, since it began um, in terms of the salaried and craft recruitment. Um, and although it's a union project, um, Railworks works in both union and non union environments and projects. So, um, 
our efforts so far have included the diversity, um, women's and veterans outreach. So those are typically the um, primary areas that we're looking to um, meet diversity goals. The company works throughout North America. So we have offices and projects um, in almost every state and um, throughout Canada as well. So um, on this particular project, we have been, um, our diversity goals, um, so we have um, been close to meeting them, but the areas we were are still um, in area, all areas of the company, but this project is, uh, specifically are having trouble recruiting um, women um, in, the, in the field. And so when we do our um, online recruiting, we use our uh, human resources information systems, we go and communicate with job boards um, that target these specific groups, um, nonprofits, um, job boards that are um, exclusive to some of these um, protected classes and whatnot. Um, but we are still falling short with the um, what we're looking for with our um, engagement of women in the field. So that is if there that would be something that we would be looking for. Um, to for any new resources, ideas, events um, in the area to to sort of engage those groups um, where we might be able to connect with them better. Thank you so much. Sorry, I, I miss miss uh, spoke your name, but thank you, Amy, for your. Oh, it's for okay. Your it happens all, all the time. <laughs> thank you. Next, uh, Bill from Minger, would you like to share a little bit about yourself and your company? Sure, Salima. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to participate today. So, Minger Construction has been in operation since 1984. We're in the underground utilities construction industry, primarily rehabilitation of existing or installation of new sanitary systems, uh, storm, sewer, so storm sewer systems, and water mains. And the majority of our work on this project is primarily uh, sanitary sewer and, and water mains. And um, we are, so being an underground, we are actually fairly far along in the process on, on this project. We're about 90% complete um, in terms of how we work to um, uh, develop a, a inclusive workforce is we work with the MNUCP mentor protege program and we do the mock interviews through Summit Academy, and those are coming up here, I believe, next week again. We participate in the Minnesota Construction Crew Job Fair, and we work with our, our unions as well. And um, probably one of the most effective tools we have is more meaningful tools is a workforce inclusion dashboard report that we look at probably every 60 days to see how we're doing on our projects. And, and uh, we need to, um, we have been challenged as well on the uh, female side and and uh, we have reached out to Aaron at Building Strong Communities and hope to have, hope to get one of those last 18 candidates that are uh, still uncommitted and uh, to continue to improve in that area. Thank you, Bill. Next, we'll ask uh, Mike uh, to tell us a little bit about your company. Okay, our company has been in business since uh, 2003. We specialize in reinforcing steel, um, miscellaneous metals, structural steel. Um, we've done uh, quite a few bridge projects and, and other projects, high rises, stadiums, uh, been participated in all that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> we work closely with five local, Ironworkers Local 512, which um, is uh, challenging to get the female participation, especially, um, uh, we've hired a number of uh, female workers over the years. And um, out of all the years since I think it was 2004 is the only female that we've ever worked with that's still in the trade <clears throat> as far as that goes. So that is really challenging. It's, it's our work is very hard intense labor tying rebar and carrying rebar and stuff and um, we work with um, 512 quite a bit uh, we've done some job fairs we send letters out to all the 
uh, people out there that are re trying to recoup female workers and as far as uh, minority workers. And um, <clears throat> it's, it's a very challenging, uh, how should I put this? It's very challenging on our end due to work schedules and workflow. This just, uh, the light rail here has been really challenging because obviously we all know it was going to start three years ago. And it kind of just moved on really slowly, really slow. And now it's starting to pick up pace. And we've been asking for help. Um, uh, and Barry can, can testify to that um, uh, for quite a while right now. And, and it doesn't matter who we're getting. We're not just getting any workers at all, whether it be anybody. <laughs> so it, right now it's very challenging and very frustrating on our part. Um, but um, we ask weekly to see who's coming to the hall and and uh we're open for suggestions on um how to do it better i guess so i i, I don't know what else to say I, i'm i'm very frustrated in the workforce <laughs> we're trying to hire people all the time and it doesn't matter who but right now it seems that i don't know if people are hiding in the weeds they don't want to come to work right now with the challenges that that's out there or Maybe things are paying better. I don't. I don't know. I, I really don't know. It's really frustrating. So, um, that that that's our approach on this. We're just trying to hire people to maintain the schedule of the of the work. It's very Thank hard. Thank you so much, Mike. Yep. Thank you. Hopefully, you're you, there's some really great uh, ideas and thoughtful people around the room here and the advisory. So hopefully, we can we can support you. I, I hope so. I really do. It's. Uh, we, we need help. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Erin, would you like to discuss uh, Egan Companies? I sure can. Um, Egan is a multi-trade union specialty subcontractor, um, primarily working in the Twin Cities and the Rochester and Austin areas. Um, as I said, we're multi-trade. Uh, in this project in particular, we are, are doing all of the electrical work associated with the civil contract. Um, so there's quite a bit of work being done in many hours um, by electricians. And so um, what else can I tell you? We, I'm um, kind of looking at the information that we've provided thus far. We, I think our challenges when it comes to workforce hiring stems from the fact that electricians are of a course, a skilled licensed trade. So um, we really take the approach of trying to drum up interest in becoming electricians through working through partnerships with Dunwoody, um, other other education facility uh, communities in the in the Twin Cities, like um, Anoka, Anoka Technical College, St. Paul College, um, attending uh, virtual career fairs and, and talking to apprentices as much as we can. Um, and truly, the, the partnership needs to happen with our union. So we do stress to them um, the importance to us of having minority and women um, uh, work for, workers come come work for Egan and, and in particular on this project. So, you know, what I put to the advisory committee is just any help or information you have about things that Egan can be doing to, to reach out to those um, folks that maybe aren't quite in the trades yet, but are interested in doing so that so that we can you know, be be a resource for them and, and show them a little bit more about whether it's becoming an electrician or a pipe fitter or a glazer or whatever it is that Egan does. We're always looking for ways to to reach out to those people and bring them into those skilled trades. Thank you very much, Erin. Um, our, our, this has been very helpful to understand not only what your company does, but the challenges that all of you have expressed. You know, our, our next question is a question that the advisory has been really grappling with because the um, the businesses around who are in the subcontractor panel today have been around for quite a while. You know, they have long longevity in the Twin Cities area and especially in the area of public contracting. So the, so the next question is that internally in your own companies, what is the representation like for women and people of color, the people that keep coming back year after year after year? What does that look like for your companies? Erin, since you're already here, would you like to start us out? Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I will do my best. I'm going to pull up the information as I'm talking. I believe all in all our numbers overall for both office and field, we have about 10% um, of our workforce is women. 
and maybe about five to six percent is people of color and indigenous indigenous people um and that that's just a rough estimate and again that includes both office and field um that's we're always helpful. looking to always looking to to do more hiring and in fact Ian is has recently engaged an outside consultant with a focus on um, diversity equity and inclusion so that we can really make this a it is a strategic priority for Ian company to be improving on diversity equity and inclusion for for all people and um and make that a real focus for us for the next three to five years thank you Amy the same question um for railworks what is the internal diversity like Sure. So I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but they are probably along the lines of what we just heard. Um, and something that we see um, often and that we're trying to change is that we do have a um, women in the company and women in leadership positions, but they um, tend to be in human resources or marketing or they're very high in certain departments and then almost don't exist in, in others. So sort of more than the um, the ratio of men, male and female employees so that we're trying to um, encourage uh, uh, women to go into the field more and to the field leadership positions and craft hourly roles. So that's the difficult part because there's there's just not the interest there. Um, so uh, that that's something that we see that we definitely have a good amount of uh, women uh, working at Railworks Corporation throughout the country, um, but they are in many of the same roles and departments. Thank you. That's helpful, Amy. I, uh, wondering, Bill, if you could tell us a little bit about your company. Internal. Absolutely, absolutely Salima. So um, both office and field, we're approximately 12% uh, female and 8% uh, people of color and, and indigenous. And what one of the initiatives we are working on is, as I shared earlier, we have a, a dashboard report that we look at all of our projects and, and see how they are performing from a, an inclusion perspective. And, and to help us be more effective, we have a goal of by June of, of 2022, we have approximately 15 crews and make sure we have good representation on each of our crews. That's an area where we're a little bit weak on yet. Some of our crews have have multiple candidates and, and some have none at this point. So that's that's one of our, our primary objectives. And, and that's what we're trying to achieve by reaching out to um, uh, building strong communities and, and see if we can't find a candidate to, to help us along with that goal. Thank you. Uh, Mike, would you like to let us know about your company? Yeah, our, our company, <clears throat> right now we currently have, <clears throat> we fluctuate so much in with employees from uh, sometimes week to week even with, with the way the work is. When we have work, we hire, and then when we don't, we have to lay off. So um, there's really no way to hold back employees. But in the office or here, there's three of us, which uh, one is Liz and then Jim and I, and then we have uh, three field soups that uh, continuously uh, uh, do different things, different uh, parts of the trade with everybody. And I think currently out of about the 80 employees, we have, um, what is it, uh, three females and roughly 26 or 27 people of color. So, um, and uh, th that's all I have to say with that. Um, I'm not used to talking in a large group of people, so <laughs> stop stumble around. <laughs> so, but uh, at any rate, <clears throat> we um, we we've been trying very hard to hire and hire as many people as we can find. And um, I know the workers have just had another class, and I think we took four or five of them. And I think, I believe they're all currently still working. So hopefully uh, there's gonna be some more classes. I, um, and uh, I'll e I even be re willing to go down and help um, with that. So if Barry's listening, so he can uh, <laughs> know that I'm on board. So thanks. Hey, I'm listening. <laughs> You're gonna call me, huh? <laughs> 
you guys, real quick, if I can support Mike with what he just said, um, and the others, you know, especially, you know, Mike and Bill and such, you know, and Salima, you love this because we have our, our monthly good faith effort meetings, you guys. Mike, the, the key to what you just said, your company, E&J, has always done such great things, and Barry can attest to this too, regarding, you know, the outreach efforts, regarding recruitment, advancement, you know, the whole thing. What I would love to see from you, and I'll, I'll give Liz and you a call later, like I've talked about, we'll meet. Um, your good faith efforts are wonderful, and we need to see those, though, each month. So we'll talk about that, but I keep up the great work. And thanks, you guys, for letting me interrupt. Th thank you. Thank you. Um, our next set of questions are, are around um, the ways in which we could support you, the unions can support you, or the community-based organizations can support you. But instead of me asking those questions, we have all these incredible minds at this advisory meeting. So I would rather open it up to them so that you can enter into a conversation with them around ideas and brainstorming ways in which the advisory can support you so that you can uh, help the primes reach their workforce goals. Uh, so I, we're going to open it up right now to the advisory. Um, and please go ahead and um, ask your questions. This is Tony O'Brien from Summon Academy. Um, what you're saying is frustrating, and yet it's also music to my ears that you still have such a demand for employment. Um, please let me know how we can help. Um, we do a variety of things. A couple people, I think, have mentioned mock interviews. We also are willing to have a job fair. I'd love to recreate this panel for my students and our alumni. Um, they would they would benefit from it greatly to know about the different opportunities. Anything we can do um, to help you get access to our students, about 500 a year in the construction program, probably about 80% of them are women and people of color or indigenous. So um, we have a steady stream all year long. So let me know what I can do. That's what we can do. Thank you so much, Tony. We would be happy to, after this uh, um, panel is complete, to send all the subcontractors the contact information for anybody here offering help so that you can reach out to them. Thank you, Tony. This is Sheila. I'm going to echo uh, some of what Tony said. I, at Goodwill Easter Sales, we do have um, construction training and would love to have you guys have access to the participants we serve. We would love to have you come and do some guest speaker um, in class to really talk about your specific areas, specifically as you're talking about electrical, um, structural, um, and we have had individuals go into a lot of those different areas out of um, training. So we'd love to have you come and be speakers, or we'd love to be able to, as Tony said, be a part of a job fair to let you understand more of what we do, um, so you can see, um, we'd love to have you come to a student graduation so you can really see the students that are available and the success that is there so they can engage with you. Or like Tony said, to do mock interviewing um, and see the uh, students firsthand um, in process as they're getting ready to go out and look for jobs in the community. So, um, and as they're looking for apprenticeships. So, um, love to stay connected. Thank you, Sheila. That's like very, very helpful. Any other questions? Um, this is Julie Brecky, um, Executive Director at Hired. Good afternoon, everyone. Great to uh, hear the panel. So happy that you assembled it. Um, I, I can't agree more uh, with Tony and Sheila. I, I think learning kind of the, um, the ways that CBO organizations can help you reach into community to identify people who would be good fits is wonderful. And as Sheila mentioned, I think one of the things that we all need to do a better job of is to say, what can we instill in training at the CBO level and have a, a really transparent handoff of what skills have been um, developed and actually what needs to happen at the union or on the job site as well. And just having a really deep understanding so that we have prepared individuals 
um, who can succeed in making a, a career in construction. I think another thing we've talked about at this table is really, um, oh, and I'm sorry, I'm just realizing my video wasn't on for any of that, my apologies. Um, the other thing we've talked about at this table is to really have an idea of uh, your future hiring needs. Uh, so in case there is a, a, a need across multiple employers for, I'm going to say 20 people for a specific skill set, that we can actually start to customize a curriculum to give some, to and recruit a group, kind of like the Building Strong Communities work, really, but uh, with a very specific intended outcome. Uh, I think those kinds of uh, hiring projections are just really helpful as we um, seek funding and seek to partner with you to customize curriculum to ensure there's that warm handoff of uh, someone who's ready to learn more um, on the job site and through the unions uh, and the uh, construction companies. Thank you, Julie. Any other questions or comments for the panel? So this is Julie again. I just have, I didn't even ask a question really. So I'm going to put that in the form of a question. Is it difficult to project hiring needs uh, for projects further out for some of the, these, uh, for some of the companies on the panel today? Is that a challenge? I did hear Mike, you in particular, I think it was saying that, you know, the, the census of your employee base fluctuates so much with contracts and um, that that's a challenge. And so I, I just wonder, how hard is it to predict out uh, for a certain skill set? Thank you. Any of the panelists want to address the projection of hiring needs and how you do it potentially for your company or if there are any challenges with that? speak on behalf of Egan and on behalf of this project, we were able to project what's happening like throughout the, the summer here and project our needs for that and throughout the, the duration of the project. I know at this point we're at about 41 electricians and we're going to hit about 55 at the peak this summer. So we are able to do that and we're hopeful that the union can supply the electricians that we need and in particular um, additional minority and women electricians to to help us meet that goal. To that end, Erin, when you approach the um, unions uh, to seek a workforce, uh, what is your process so that you can you you can be asking for the diversity within the bench? My my understanding from our labor manager is that we do, you know, give them a call, shoot them an email. I think both and let them know how many journey workers or um, apprentices we're looking for and, and, and emphasize to them that this is for the light rail project and that to the extent they have women or minority um, electricians available, we'd love to love to employ them. It's very helpful. Thank you, Erin. Anyone else have any uh, anything to add or help us better understand how you do the projections? This is Julie again. I'm just wondering, even if if the the unions, um, uh, you know, as as a whole, as an umbrella for uh, the certain kind of work, if if they're taking aggregate projections across employers that they are hearing, you know, is there kind of that central clearinghouse to to really help understand um, how many folks are are currently employed, how many are on the bench, how many more do we think we are going to be needing in the six, twelve, eighteen month. Um, Kind of time window is that something that that's done yeah julie i can comment on that um <clears throat> so when we decide how many apprentices to take we are you know we reach out to all of our contractors we see how much work that they're projecting they're going to have um <clears throat> to mike's comment earlier you know the light rail was supposed to start three years ago and then it start. you know it was delayed a year so <clears throat> Jobs, stuff like that happens all the time. Last year, we were in January, February, thinking we were going to take 100 apprentices. Then COVID hit, and we were only able to take 30. 
Um, this year we're still getting out of COVID, and I could that's the iron worker number. Obviously, we have a little different process than the operators and the laborers do as far as you know the contractor can hire direct and then they can hire anyone and then they're uh, slotted into their apprenticeship where with the iron workers it's a, it's the opposite we we recruit we train and then we supply to the contractor once they're asked so yeah i, I think that's a constant um <clears throat> not a struggle but a constant effort on behalf of all the unions is to try to figure out how much work is coming hopefully we don't have a pandemic to change everything or you know jobs getting delayed now material costs are up so that's going to um, slow some building down um, lead time on materials is getting longer and longer so that delays projects so you know that's what we do all the time is try to figure out how much work is coming and then uh, adjust accordingly, you know. Um, <clears throat> so if that answers your question, Julie. Barry, that's really helpful. I'm sure that it's always a work in progress um, and trying to get those accurate numbers. And then the variables you talked about with, you know, a pandemic once in a century and then escalating costs. I know there's a lot to navigate, so it's not easy to do. But that's that's usually something that in the nonprofit sector we're eager to hear about so that we can, again, partner and, and try and customize curriculum to help you meet those numbers. Um, so I think that's that's really helpful to know. Thank you. Hey, Julie. It, it, it's Chris um, coming from the contractor side when you ask the question, how do we project our workforce needs for a project? It's actually kind of a fun but very difficult project uh, process, and it even includes um, the owner because a big, big piece of pricing a project is knowing how many people or how many workforce hours it will approximately per trade to finish their portion of the work. You know, so you look at the Met Council as at at the architects and engineer. You know, everybody working on that piece, they have their idea. Then you have the people proposing on the project, such as our LMJV. You know, we have our team of experts, the estimators and such, working on, you know, the scope of work and approximate hours it would take to finish the project. And then it gets handed to the contractors actually doing the scope of work. And one of the things we do with the Department of Human Rights, part of our team, is their workforce projections at the beginning of the project. And then, like Barry said, then all of a sudden things change, schedules get delayed, you know, so those numbers do fluctuate. But that's kind of where those numbers come from way back at the beginning stages of a project. I hope that helps a little, Julie. Yeah, Krista, thank you so much. Um, it, it sounds like more of an art than a science. Um, so I really do appreciate that background. And I guess, you know, the reason I mentioned this is that I, I think we can start looking for um, to, to help introduce uh, BIPOC community and, and women to a career in construction, if we can kind of understand what those needs are and that we can help them understand how to bridge from project to project. Because so many of the people we're working with are looking for sustainable family wages to support their families and, and how they can create careers. And I, I think sometimes it's a bit of a mystery. Uh, to some of the folks that we're working with. I know I'm still on a learning curve for understanding all the nuances. So I really do appreciate uh, your perspective and sharing, Krista. Happy to help, Julie. Thank you, Krista. Thank you, Jane. I have a question for Barry. Oh. Yeah, go ahead, Elaine. Yeah, Barry, when when the iron workers or even other unions start uh, looking at opening apprenticeship apprenticeship um, classes, is does that occur on a scheduled basis? Like we open them every every you know, and are on such and such constant, or do they are they staggered? And how you you mentioned that the iron workers do their recruiting. How do you go about that? Uh, <clears throat> I didn't hear that last part about the iron workers. Um, but 
I think I, I think understand very, you. I'm sorry. What I was saying is, go oh. ahead, Elaine. We just you were just cut off a little bit. Go ahead. Try again. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, when you uh, um, you you met, um, you. you for their apprenticeship classes, how do you go about that? Where do you source um, potential candidates? Well, we and do we'll, that occur um, on a scheduled basis. Was the other part of it? Okay, I think I can answer. So we take applications all year long, and we usually interview in March, so we can get the apprentice class with our. We do a week and a half training so that. When they go to the job site, they have a certain level of uh, safety awareness and some trade exposure before they get to the job site. So we we take interviews or applications all year, interview in March, have our apprenticeship class in April, um, and then try to get the new apprentices ready to go to work by May 1st. Most of the unions have uh, a set time when they get the apprentices ready and to go. Um, laborers and operators are a little different because the contractor can um, sponsor someone into their trade. So then they have the classes start every fall, but they can hire all year long. Um, <clears throat> we, pre-COVID, we were doing about one outreach event a week between Min Minneapolis, St. Paul and Duluth. Um, last year, our recruiting efforts were, um, you know, that's construct tomorrow, that's high school, uh, shop classes, that's community college, Votex, it's working with building strong communities. Um, so with COVID, that was down a little last year, but now that things are opening up, hopefully we'll, um, be able to do that. Like last year, we didn't have any Construct Tomorrow events. There's nine scheduled throughout the state of Minnesota this year. So um, our recruiting efforts will be a little easier now that the COVID restrictions have been lifted a little bit. Thank you, Barry. Very, very helpful. Thank you, Barry. That's really helpful. Thank you. Any any other questions from, from uh, advisory members? for our subcontractors? You know, this is Sheila. Sorry, Barry, we're all picking on you. I have another question for you um, as you're talking. When you're um, getting new candidates, are you looking, you're looking at all types of construction for you. And when I say that, I'm talking vertical and horizontal construction, correct? Correct, because uh, a journeyman iron worker needs to be able to do everything. Now, certain people, uh, now gravitate towards one aspect of the trade or, or the other. We train everyone to do all aspects because like right now, for instance, even you know, Mike was saying, uh, all everyone who does rebar is working right now. So, but if you're only structural only, or you only want to weld, you won't take that job, but that means you're staying home and you're not making a wage or you're, your health benefits and all of that. So we train everyone to do everything and okay. iron work related. So then if I was working on light rail and, um, and I was in an apprenticeship and my project ended, could I shift to a vertical construction project? Yes. Okay. And that happens all the time. And even if you were working on the light rail as an apprentice for E and J, you know, if they caught up to the poor, they, like Mike said, they do um, miscellaneous metals and structural. You could work three of those different aspects in one week as okay. an apprentice or as a journey person as well. So people can so, move around to get their hours. They don't have to stay in one segment of construction. Okay. Thank you. That was helpful. Thank you very much, Barry. Okay, this is Julie. I have another question for Barry. <laughs> sorry, Barry. That's um, right. uh, what, I, Barry needs to do a presentation. <laughs> I think so. I, I heard your. I don't um, think so. 
you're the 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 instruction is really for the month of April and then going to work in May. And so the exposure and kind of the training overall, I, I don't want to misunderstand. Are you saying that that's really just a month of training? Or is that on top of some other foundational training too? Well, that's a month, a week and a half of training before they're um, eligible to go to a job site. When they start a lot of our work. training is on the job, and then wow. school starts in September, and it runs like the regular school year. So they'll have classes two nights a week from September to through May, but. Yeah, they go out with one week of training and, and week and a half of training for safety related training. And then uh, <clears throat> the rest of their exposure is in the field. Got it. So OSHA or something like that. We do OSHA 30 as part of the training. Uh, we do aerial lift, subpart R, which is an OSHA requirement for steel erection, uh, M Shaw, so they can work in the mines because a lot of times we have work in Duluth in the mines and you have to have that. So um, <clears throat> CPR, first aid. Um, Great. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you, Barry. Yep. Uh, we, had, we had one question from a, from a panelist that I just wanted to uh, bring back to the subcontractors, which was that is that when you are able to bring people on, people of color or women on on a project, um, what is your retention process how, how do you how do you approach the retention side to to put yourself in a position where you will then have someone as a part of your core team versus just having to lay them off at the end of the cycle i can speak to that from egan company's perspective we you know, if we've got a great employee, we're going to do everything we can to retain them. And that's, of course, with outside construction, there is some level of layoffs that happen every winter. But if we've got a core team member, we're going to do everything we can to move them around and move them to indoor work in the winter and things like that nature to make sure that they're they're employed and part of our core team. We've got enough work to do it, you know, as a company as large as we have with the different electrical organizations and, and divisions, we, we can do it as much as we, we are able. Thank you, Erin. Anyone else? Um, Minger, E&J, Railworks? Yeah, certainly I could just kind of come in briefly on that. Two things we have done is, uh, number one, speak to the foreman and superintendent on that specific crew and to make sure they're taking initiatives to provide for an inclusive environment on their crew. And then secondly, we usually put a calendar reminder out there to follow up with our new crew members just to see how it's going and, and making sure that uh, the environment is, is favorable for them. Thank you. Very, very helpful. Any other questions from our pan for our panelists from our advisory team? Selena, Ashanti, any questions I, from Yorin? Yeah, but before I, I, I want uh, other uh, advisory members to be able to ask questions first, and I see that uh, Mary Schmidt has her hand up, and I want to make sure that Julie and Sheila are your hands still up or you, you have more questions for Barry? My bad. That's that's user Zoom etiquette, right? 101, I messed up. I'm taking it down. <laughs> Mine also, sorry. Thanks, Ashanti. Yeah, this is Mary Schmidt from MnDOT. Um, and I think I may be following up on what Salima just asked. Yeah, I just wanted to hear a little bit more about how or what else maybe can happen to weather that, especially that first year of layoff, because I mean, just sort of anecdotally, what I've heard is that just can be that most difficult time where we can lose people in the industry um, because because of that 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 winter layoff. And um, I think maybe Aaron, you mentioned that you 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 might reach out and try and and somehow find, as you said, office work or something for them to do. But yeah, I was just hoping to hear a little bit more about is is it is it more difficult now than five years ago? Is it not as difficult? Um, yeah, just sort of what what can we maybe as an industry be trying to do to to hang on to those workers? Understanding, of course, that 
we live in Minnesota and, you know, speaking for MnDOT, yeah, there's just going to be months during the year where we're going to have, you know, almost no project works happening. Thank you. Uh, since I, I think that question was partially directed at me, so I'll, I'll try and take it again. And I, I apologize, I don't have the perspective on, you know, now versus five years ago. Um, but I do know that there it's inevitably there's going to be some layoffs you just can't get away from that but uh we've got a new labor manager um for our electricians who has made it like his life's work to make sure he keeps as many of our core team busy for as much as he can and we don't have people sitting on the sidelines waiting to get called um so as things slow down this fall you know I, what my hope is is that he'll be engaged in finding work for all of our electricians that we possibly can um, to keep them keep them involved in other projects that we have going on around the metro, and so that they're ready and, and able to come come work again on the light rail project when when they're when that's back up and running in the spring. Thank you, Aaron. I can't raise my hand. It's Krista, you guys. I try to raise my hand and be polite, but instead I get to blurt out. <laughs> no, no worries. Go for it, Krista. Mary, it's a great question. And, you know, to have the CBOs on here that are so awesome. And then Barry, who represents all of our trades. Nice job, Barry. But anyways, you guys, one of the things that I've seen, you know, throughout the years regarding retention, is as many of you guys have heard me say, that's my biggest um, hurdle I'd like to try and help accomplish. So, you know, you talk about the winter months, you know, and different things, it's inevitable, especially with the heavy highway projects and stuff. So there's kind of a twofold thing. One of it is in the, the soft skills, you know, training, whether it coming, be coming from the CBOs, the unions, from the contractors ourselves, is we need to better prepare those individuals for financial planning regarding those winter layoffs and such what does it look like it's almost like becoming an educator you know you have to plan for those summer quote unquote layoffs and such so you have that piece going into the trade but then actually when the layoffs do happen and they are sitting stagnant taking a look at the government funding that's available for continuing education grants maybe take a look at what pieces could we be training those individuals and provide a little substance, you know, a little money for those individuals for attending these things regarding taking them to the next skill level or, you know, education piece. There's, there's, it, I think it's a really cool round table, not just discussion, but action plan of what can we do moving forward to ensure that during those off times, something is taking place Yes, they get their, you know, unemployment, but what can we be doing to bring them to that next level of employment um, gold star, you know? So when the, when the hiring does fire back up again, they have this extra, hey, look at what I did during my time off, you know? So there's, there's mine. Thank you, guys. This is Tony from Summit. I am sure that Goodwill and Julie from Hired would agree that we, could, we are exactly positioned to provide that kind of winter education. And I'm convinced that the three of us could work together to put that together for as many people as are available. Love it. And Love it. I would say that we have funding that comes in that probably is going to sponsor that for the most part. Or we could also, this is Sheila, or we could also, you know, there's new funding going to be coming down here with all this um, American Rescue Plan dollars for training, and there would be opportunities to use it for that type of stuff, too. If I could comment. <laughs> um, so most of the unions have their training centers open in the winter when uh, people are laid off so they can come in and do additional training. Um, <clears throat> you know. That's what the unions do. Once you're a, a member, it's our job to train them, to train our apprentices. So a lot of the unions have extra hours available in the winter for training. And, and that's, if you're working and, and you are laid off, that's what the, all the individuals should do. 
I completely agree with Barry, but how do we get them there, Barry? <laughs> right? You know, I mean, we try. You guys have always been such great advocates regarding, hey, here's what's going on during the layoffs. But really, you know, those others that are on board here, you guys need to listen. They choose not to do these things. You know, so it is a it's a hurdle moving forward. And I, I'm right there with Barry. You know, this is Julie. I would just offer that 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 potentially is kind of Sheila and Tony mentioned would qualify for incumbent worker training potentially. Like, and so there's the possibility of of if we can really kind of get a worker voice to inform what it would take for to incentivize them to come and train over the winter. Um, I I think that sounds like a great follow up conversation because there's so much promise there. If you've got the instructors in the facilities, and you can help people figure out the next credential they need to attain for to, to get promoted going forward, which of course I know you guys do in your sleep. Um, I think that'd be a really interesting conversation. Uh, generally speaking, the unions aren't uh, <clears throat> qualified or they're not, they don't qualify to receive that funding. We're all 100% private funded through our members. So we wouldn't be able to get we wouldn't be able to train under a, a grant like that because we wouldn't be eligible. Well, you know, Barry, this is where I think the conversation could go. Um, and oh, I'm sorry, Sheila. No, go you? ahead, Julie. Go ahead. We're probably going the same place, but go ahead. <laughs> well, and that's where you know, from in a, a grant writing scenario, the CBO could be the applicant, and we could identify the value of what your in kind training at the trades would be. And we could be hiring navigators and support services or, you know, using those dollars that way to help people uh, really engage and come in for training. So I think there's, uh, and maybe that's not allowable either. Again, I, I don't know. Do you know, Barry? I'm not sure either. Okay. Um, no, and I, I, I was, oops, sorry, Barry, go ahead. No, I, I just, I don't know how that would work. And, and I, I don't think we'd be eligible, but. You know that's what the unions do is train right and i don't know how it would work to partner in that way i think what julie's getting at is where i was going to go barry and that not necessarily that we, there's other options there and not that we always have to do the training so when julie was talking career navigators it's the funding comes in to help support, provide other types of support so our career navigators, as Julie will talk about, do those supports for the individuals to make sure they're having the outside needs met so they can get to your training and get things done and then helping with that employment or whatever other components they need on the backside. So part of that money may be able to give them stipends to um, come to training and, and if they show involvement over certain times to pay them for involvement over certain times. So sometimes that's incentive to get individuals to uh, make it through the long haul. And that's some of the stuff I think where Julie and I are thinking on the same wavelength here, where we can typically sometimes use some of that funding um, to be able to make those things happen. So, um, you know, it'd be a discussion we'd need to have, but it is, it, there are opportunities there sometimes. Okay, and I, I didn't, you guys would do the training. It wouldn't be anybody else doing the training. Okay, and, and I didn't quite understand what, yeah, so that makes sense. And that would be a good discussion to have, you know, collectively we could work something out, so see what is available and how we could do that. This is Mike um, with e &J. <clears throat> So what you're saying is that it would be up to the individual to apply for that so that they could go above and beyond, let's say they're on unemployment at that time, and still go in and get um, trained. Is that is that what you're saying, how, how it would work out? It wouldn't necessarily involve the union as far as payment or reimbursement, but it would be the individual would apply for it, just like they apply for unemployment or whatever, saying, hey, I'm going to go do – uh, get recertified or certified in welding or or, or certified in post tension installation or so, so on and so forth. This is, I'm talking about stuff for our trade, of course. But um, <clears throat> is that is that what you're thinking? Because I, I think that would work for uh, some people. That that's one of our struggles in the union is to get the uh, people to go back and get 
a little more educated in the, in their field in in their line of work as certifications um, run out. Um, I mean, you can put uh, 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 post tension cables in your whole life, and if you forget to re reinstate your certification, you're considered not qualified to do it any longer. And um, I, I think uh, that would be a good idea if there was some kind of an incentive that way to get everybody to go back in and, and get a little more education in their field. Yeah, this is Julie. I, I think that this is a conversation worth following up on. I mean, I you know, I, I know that with some of the rescue plan dollars or even some of the other uh, workforce development funds, especially for focusing on um, trying to sustain women and um, people of color uh, in careers in construction and this kind of uh, uh, stackable credential and training when they'd be laid off, we'd have to really probably think through the notion of the conflict of unemployment and things like that. But, it, you know, it's just worthwhile to have a good conversation. And I don't know, maybe we can work with Salima to follow up on facilitating scheduling a meeting for a brainstorming session. We would be happy to help. Thank you. That's a great idea. Yeah, this is Sheila. There's just a lot of different ways to look at the different, as Julie is talking about too, the different funding streams that are out there that can do different things um, and allow for different things. So it would be good to talk about needs and opportunities. Thank you. Yeah, you had a question? Yeah, I, I do have a question for the subcontractors that are here. Um, so far this year, uh, I guess it's a two-part question. Uh, have you done any hiring? And um, when you've done hiring, and I guess uh, the process is reach out to the unions, uh, what have been the responses that you've gotten from the unions, whether they have or do not have any women or PLC? Um, this is Aaron from Egan. Uh, we have done some hiring. I uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me of how much hiring we've done. Um, the response from the union is, we'll do our best, and then we see who we get. Um, we do. I know that we've hired women and um, people of color in the in the recent weeks and months, so there is some level of success there. Uh, but I can't say that it's. Uh, 100% every time that we ask for it, we get get a woman or a person of color. Do you ever, Aaron, do you ever sponsor people into the trades, like in the laborers or those kinds of situations where you're allowed to sponsor somebody and bring them in? Uh, I don't believe that we do. I, I think we've broached that conversation with the, uh, with the electoral unions in the past, and that is uh, not something that flies with them. Um, and we, we don't hire many laborers, so it's, it's, not something I can speak to on that front. That's helpful. All right, following up on that a little bit, um, my question primarily is for uh, Aaron and Mike as well, um, just in terms of, can you talk about any uh, programs, initiatives, efforts um, that have been driven uh, by your companies um, versus, you know, some, some of the efforts that we've heard from Barry and that, and that uh, are driven by the trades. Um, and I would put uh, building strong communities in that, um, in, in that realm to bring in uh, more people of color and women, not only into your companies, but in the industries, utilizing your resources and time and being the drivers of those initiatives or programs. Can you talk about any any ones that you have done in the past or are planning um, uh, for the future? Um, I love that question and I love the idea behind it. And I, I can say that we, we haven't been a driver. Um, we've participated in career fairs. We have donated money to scholarship funds, um, things of that nature. And part of the reason that I love your question is because it's exactly where Egan would like to go. And as I mentioned before, we hired an outside consultant 
And, and given the, you know, we hire folks in 11, I think 12 different trades. And so for me as the, the EEO officer and the, and the DEI leader at Egan, what I want to do is make a focused effort and a, and a, and a meaningful effort in doing exactly what you're saying. And so my hope is with the help of this consultant can really give us a laser focus on how best to be the driver instead of just being a passenger on all of these other activities that are already happening in the Twin Cities. So I hope that in a year you can ask me this question and I'm gonna have a better answer for you then hopefully soon. If, if I may, um... Uh, Aaron, no, uh, help me understand. What What do you mean by being the driver versus? I mean, what, well, I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm not utilizing that. utilizing your vernacular, and when I say being a driver, it's we we like to talk to folks like. And it granted with COVID, it didn't happen very much last year, if at all. But in you know 2019, we had started meeting with folks from Summit and the Urban League and um, Goodwill, and just sort of like being a being a, a partner with them on, on the things that we're able to do as a, as a skilled trade organization. Um, we can't just directly hire from Goodwill the, the folks that are coming out of, of their programs. As much as I'd love to, to have a community-based organization that has that direct, you know, one-to-one -one hiring um, uh, participation in, with sponsorship into the union, of course. Um, but what I would like to do, I, I think my dream in my role is to start doing things like um, sponsoring tours of our shops and warehouses and and maybe even some of our job sites so that folks can see what egan does across all of our trades um, um donating our time and our our resources and our our brain power to to organizations like construct tomorrow and the yeah. and like the girl scouts and kind of being a leader in terms of inviting people into egan and seeing what egan is doing instead of like i said being a passenger and just saying like here's some money for a scholarship please Please be an electrician. Um, no, I think that would help. And uh, to your point about the, the the money for scholarships, I mean, you can do more direct things because obviously you have to get have people go through the union. I get that. Mm -hmm. um, so one of my concerns, uh, and that's the beauty of us being able to just have this conversation, is that uh, you know, this face, this face, Egan is kind of been like predominantly a white company. Um, when you bring people in, are you prepping your folks? Because I can see that maybe being a problem down the line. Have you thought that through? So if you bring on new people, I mean, two things and bring on new people. Um, have you thought about the environment and, and, and it's a good idea, I think, to reach out to high schools and maybe have you all like set up a pipeline, like you were saying, you're doing scholarships. Have you set up one that goes, you know, to the person directly to you guys? That, that I mean, that makes sense. That would make sense to me. It's not something that is um, we've considered yet, but I'd love to learn more about what you're thinking on that because um, because we can't sponsor sponsor people directly into like the electrical unions. Um, okay. So it's it that's like I say, it's a problem for us to just identify a, a superstar and then say, come to Egan. It it has to always come through the union, and so it, so part of part of the strategy going forward for Egan, I believe, is going to be a, a a good partnership with the unions as well. To not just say, not just say come to Egan, but come to the Union Electrical Trades, um, and and you're going to have a, a great career and, and a great place to work. So, is it possible to to work out a deal with with, with uh, the electrical unions? Because you know, um, there's quite a few women in electrical trades, from my understanding. So, you've been able to, you all have been able to recruit women a little easier, right? Okay, that's right. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that is an accurate statement. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, what we found out in doing this work sometimes is, you know, you just have to keep asking, you know, and sometimes things exist that you are, you are not aware of because um, I think that, that that roadblock shouldn't be there, especially if you're willing to make a commitment. You make If you guys make a commitment of money, I think that you, you know, there's got to be a way for you to benefit from it. I think that's unfair. Uh, but, uh, oh, and so about the environmental question, have you all thought about that and, and, and what that, you know, have you... Are you dealing with that issue? Because we've dealt with that. You know, I'm, I'm saying it to you because when we first started doing this work, we were getting people in jobs that where, you know, the, the workforce was predominantly white and, you know, there was some resistance and, you know, they went through some changes that they may not have had to go through had they prepared the workforce. Sure. sure. Um, and so I'll, I'll answer your question in two ways. First is, I think it was two and a half weeks ago, I personally went out to the light rail site and, and gave them the 
here I am. If you are ever uncomfortable, if you ever think that there's a problem, reach out to me, reach out to your supervisor, reach out to whomever you think is, is necessary to, to address those problems. So we've, I've tackled it from that, um, from that perspective, but also, like I say, we're, we've engaged this consultant and what I really love about the process that we're just getting kicked off right now is that she will be doing a company wide assessment with it with focus groups to ask the questions that you're asking. What's the environment like? What problems do you see? What do you like? Um, things like that. And so that it's not just me sort of talking to a group over lunch. We're going to get an, an, an anonymous responses on what is the work environment like so that we know what what problems to address right now. We're just sort of, you know, hoping to just catch somebody with a with a generalized talk like I give just hoping to catch somebody's attention if they if they believe there's a problem. But with the assessment, we'll actually be able to drill down on if, if there are problems, which there probably are um, just with a company of this size. What are they and how can we better fix them? And, and that would help a lot. And Salima, actually, that question is for all the subcontractors on the call if they'd want to step up and, and, and answer. Let me just pick yeah. on. Yeah, don't, <laughs> don't give me thank the hot seat by myself. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, thank you. Thank you, Erin. I, I just wanted to repeat uh, the question, which is that what, what is what are you doing to improve the workplace culture so that when you are recruiting uh, people of color and women entering, that it is a, a workplace that is welcoming and has ha has been prepared for that? And that's the question. Um, Minger Railworks, uh, e J. Yeah, I'd be happy to jump in. Uh, I did mention previously that when we do make a hire, we like to speak to our foreman and superintendents of that crew and make sure that they provide a, a favorable environment and, and also doing that follow up, follow up uh, check in. But also it, it, for us, it also starts at the orientation. Um, as part of our orientation process, we set expectations about the environment that we want and, and uh, we let them know if, if they are experiencing any challenges that they can talk to us, but we also set the expectation that they provide a favorable environment. So everyone needs to participate. And then um, uh, lastly, at, at our all, at our annual training, uh, we have education on that and just talking about uh, providing, uh, you know, a favorable workplace uh, at Minger. And, and Bill, you with ENJ? Uh, who's with Minger? Okay. Who's with ENJ? Mike, Mike yeah, you, yeah. So, Mike, you all seem to uh, be doing a fairly decent job. What What are you doing that's different from other folks? Smile a lot? No. <laughs> no, I. It, it's um. <clears throat> we strive to higher from the hall because the hall has such a good reputation of training people. And with that being said, when we load up our jobs or try to do that, people come to us and, and they say one day on a Tuesday, they come out to light rail, but we, we have to shuffle our employees around to where they're needed so much mm -hmm. that it's so hard <laughs> I, I, I was listening to the rest of you guys talking. It sounds like they get in a group and they're there. There's people that go to jobs that are there for a day, maybe two days, and they move to another job, and it might be just them and another foreman or another person working. It's it's really hard for us to recruit people and hold them to that point because it's it's kind of an individual deal when when, when we're working. It's hard to hard to explain. Like when we're doing a bridge deck, we'll we'll have people go out there, and if anybody's seen bridge decks, it's a. I think it's terrible because it's backbreaking work. Is you're bent over all day long, but we might have ten to fifteen iron workers on that bridge deck, and it's probably going to last anywhere from three to ten days. Ten days is a long bridge deck, but then we have to disperse and go to other parts of the job, and that and that's what makes our our hiring practices so hard is that all of a sudden the contractors and it seems like it never fails when when one part of the job is ready another contractor will call then another contractor will call and all of a sudden we can we can be in one day's time we can be 15 workers short for the next day and it's such a hard problem and i'm listening to egan talk 
you were doing a very good job, by the way. I'm, I'm enjoying listening to you because it, it would be kind of nice to, to have a big job to put people on and just have them stay there and learn the trade. But when, when Barry says they have these classes come out, and we've been part of that where we go out there and, and, and try to help and watch people get a crash course in tying. And, and it's frustrating because when you bring a, a new person on like that, not only do you, do you have the, the eight guys that you need there, when you bring two new people on, you've actually lost two of your eight guys to try to help those people move forward. And uh, it's just, it, it's, it's very, very hard. And uh, the, the iron workers, I got to say, um, I've been in the iron workers uh, 44 years and, and, and Barry with the group he's got now, they, they are doing a tremendous job in, in trying to recruit people to come out there and, and uh, Barry, I'm not sucking up to you or nothing like that, but I'm just saying, <laughs> I, I, cause I, I actually was an apprenticeship teacher myself for a few years uh, for the local. And um, it, it's very hard for bringing these people to go, eight hours a day out in the field and three hours at night to come in after work. And uh, Barry, uh, you guys, you guys are doing a good job. Um, we, we meet Barry and I and Liz had a conversation the other day and we we're trying to put our finger on is how many uh, ironworking companies there is in our, in our, in our iron workers. And Barry, you came up with about 105, you said, and, and we asked how many females are actually apprentices or in uh, iron workers and, and Barry, I believe you said there's 43. So if you yeah. divide 43 into 105 companies, it's hard. And uh, we, we've had some very good uh, female iron workers working for us over the years, but they just don't seem to want to stay in the trade. Um, and uh, we're, our, our arms are open to them. So I'm just saying, if anybody knows of anybody that's interested in it, Send them down to local 512 because when we recruit, we go down to local 512 because we can't sponsor anybody in. If we meet somebody that we feel would be a good candidate, we always tell them, hey, call you know Pete Taglin down there at the apprenticeship and get signed up. And and um, I, I know they I think they make exceptions actually myself for people like that to come down there and work and get a job. So did I answer your question? I probably got off track a little bit here. So <laughs> I get a little nervous when I get put on the spot here. So no, no, you, you did great, Mike. Thank Thanks. you. Um, Mel, was that, was that some, the information you were looking for? <laughs> some of it, but it, it, it's all good. Um, uh, but I got it. Yeah. I got a little sense of he's got a good relationship with, with Dave. So, yeah, so this is you, good progress. You can, you can ask me a question, though. I, sometimes I get off track here a little bit. So <laughs> no if worries. you want to ask me a point blank question, go ahead. I'll try to answer it. No, we're good. I tell you what, <laughs> it would be great, uh, Salim, uh, Ashanti, you guys, uh, if uh, we can have these guys because we're running out of time. I see people leaving. Uh, I just happen to have a little extra time. So I, I know your time is short. But it would be great if we could, uh, to uh, uh, Sister's point, you know, about a year from now, things will be different. Um, It'd be great to have them um, uh, again, um, you know, maybe six months from now or so, um, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, if they're, if they're open. Um, and this is good because this is how we make progress. And now, and then you all come on and you see, you know, what we're doing and, and how we're monitoring it. And the whole point is that for, uh, you know, for everybody, you know, to uh, share in this thing and for it to work out, we put this great project together and everybody benefits, you know, so. Um, so I really would like to see that happen again. And uh, everybody's leaving us. <laughs> no, uh, thank you, Mel. Uh, um, we will absolutely take take up your idea on that and welcome welcome the subcontractors to come back soon. And you're always welcome, by the way, to attend the meeting uh, if you are ever interested in, in, in just being a part of it. We would love to have you join. Um, thank you. Uh, Ashanti, I will turn it over to you. Yes, I'm just going to echo... Um, what you said, Salima, thank you to the uh, representatives of the subcontractors uh, that participated in the panel. Um, great conversation, um, good information. And yes, we look uh, forward to inviting you back uh, sometime in the future. Um, with that, I would like to thank everybody and um, uh, say uh, great meeting and uh, we will see you next time in a
Thanks. All righty.